Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining our e-seminar today, Rehabilitation Using the NeuroCom Long Force Plate Case Studies. My name is Teresa Boone. I'm the Director of Global Education at Adis Medical, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator of today's presentation. You may have noted that your line was muted on entry into the meeting space, and that's done intentionally to keep background noise to a minimum during today's presentation. If you have questions during today's presentation, kindly type them into the chat box or the Q&A box located on the right-hand side of the screen. I'll moderate those questions for our presenter at the end of today's presentation. The expected duration of today's presentation is approximately one hour, and we understand that if you have to drop off after the presentation, that's so, certainly understandable. If you'd like to stay on, our presenter has agreed to stay on and answer those questions at the end. Without further delay, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Kevy Ames graduated from Boston University in 1991, earned her DPT from MGH Institute of Health Professions in 2010, and her MBA from Merrillhurst University in 2012. Kevy specializes in the evaluation and treatment of patients with acquired brain injury and vestibular disorders. Kevy currently manages outpatient rehabilitation clinics for Kaiser Permanente. She also co-owns a consulting company which emphasizes education for clinicians, parents, and coaches on best practices in the field of concussion management. Kevy has been a NeuroCom customer since 1992 and has been teaching the NeuroCom Clinical Integration Seminar since 1997. Thank you, Kevy, for joining us today and sharing your valuable expertise. The presentation is now yours. Thanks, Teresa. It's great to be here, and thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Um, we are going to talk about the long force plate today and how to maximize your rehab using the long force plate. When I get calls from the field, people asking questions about rehab, oftentimes the questions are related to the long force plate because there aren't specific instructions for the specific activities on the long force plate. So I'm going to go through a couple of those activities today and hopefully help you be able to problem solve if you're running into questions on the long force plate activities. But before we get into the cases, I'd like to do a brief review on the importance of your assessment and how your assessment will feed into your treatment planning. So I'd like to review some of the critical aspects of controlled functional mobility. When we think about mobility, we have to consider both gaze stability and postural stability. As we're moving through the world, our postural stability is important, but our gaze stability is equally as important. Because if our gaze does not remain stable, then our whole world seems like it's moving, and we can um, really have trouble with our balance if our gaze stability is off. So the definition of gaze stability is the ability to maintain gaze or visual focus on an external target during movement. So this is a function of the vestibulo-ocular reflex, the VOR, and we're looking at this reflex um, predominantly at speeds greater than 85 degrees per second of head movement. When we look at postural stability, that's the ability to maintain the body center of gravity over the base support in a given sensory environment. So we need to take both of these sides of the equation into consideration when we are developing treatment plans for our patients. The sensory environment tends to be a piece that is missed during long force plate rehab because our dynamic systems, our neurocom dynamic systems, have built-in sensory challenges. Sensory meaning what's going on in the environment around me that may impact my balance. When you're using the long force plate, you have to be a little bit more creative in creating a sensory challenge for your patients. So just as a reminder, the sensory environment is the condition which exists or is perceived to exist in the real world that impact balance. I like to use the 
the example of um, growing up in Buffalo, New York, where it was very, very snowy and cold. And in the winter, when I was walking out to my park, to my car in the parking lot, I walked very differently over an icy parking lot than I did when there was a dry, smooth parking lot. So the perception of the environment and how it's going to impact your balance is going to impact how your patients are moving. So we need to consider sensory when we're developing our treatment plans, even if we are using the long force play. When we consider both sensory and motor, it's going to help us define our, both our assessment and our intervention. So this is the dynamic equilibrium model. And what you'll see here is we're including both sensory input and motor output as critical components for successful balance. So if we look at the sensory side, let's see if I can get my pointer here, is the sensory side of this equation. And what we're looking at in the sensory side is vision, vestibular, and somatosensory input, and how those sensory systems are going to impact our success or non-success with our balance. And then we also have the motor output side especially looking at how our muscles are reacting to different sensory challenges. So when we're testing and treating our patients, we need to consider the sensory impact coming in through our sensory system and how our motor output is responding to that sensory demand. What we have learned from the literature is that if we include sensory in our treatment of our patients, the literature has demonstrated that we can improve both the functional impairments that we're seeing and the mobility limitations that we're seeing with our patients. So it's important that we address the sensory side and the motor side when we are creating our treatment plans for the long force play. So how do we think about creating our treatment plans? What we need to look at first is our test results. So we're going to look at our Neurocom test results. We're going to be looking at um, our motor tests, our, our limits of stability test, our rhythmic weight shift test. Those tests are going to help us determine where are the motor impairments that need to be addressed with this patient. But we're not limited to just our neurocon test when we're creating a motor task for our patient. We're going to be looking at our exam, the, the exam in its entirety. We're going to be look at range of motion. We're going to look at strength. We're going to look at other clinical tests to determine what type of motor tasks are going to be important to incorporate for this patient. We also need to look at where the sensory breakdowns may be happening for our patients. So on our Neurocom system, we're going to be looking at the modified CTSAB on the long force plate or the SOT sensory organization test on our dynamic force plate. Once we identify where the patient is having a breakdown on the motor side and the sensory side, that's when we can get in and determine what's going to be the best treatment approach for our patient. Motor, selection of a motor task is much more concrete and obvious for the patient. For one thing, um, for the physical therapists that have joined us, we look very closely at motor output for our patient. Um, the motor targets can be easily identified from the limited stability test or the rhythmic weight shift test or some of the functional tests on our long force plate. We can easily see from the limits of stability test, where does this patient have trouble shifting their center of gravity? We can see from the walk across test, where does this patient have asymmetries in their gait? And motor tends to be, um, tends to be more concretely associated from our assessment into our treatment on the long force plate. The sensory environment, however, um, oh, I'm sorry, challenge tasks take a little bit more creativity. So 
what I want you to think about as we're going through the law enforcement activities is anything that you can do with your patients on a gym floor, you can do with your patient on the long force play. When you add the activity, the benefit of the biofeedback of the long force play to the activity, it adds an additional layer of challenge, concentration, and neuromuscular connection for that patient doing that activity. The sensory environment, like I said earlier, is a bit more challenging to determine what might be appropriate on your long force plate. Like I said before, the dynamic system, the sensory organization task, has many choices for both surface and visual challenge that you can just program right into your dynamic system. The modified CTSIB gives the option of foam. But when we move to treatment, we need to be creative in how we create an appropriate sensory challenge, both from the level of the surface and from the level of the visual surround. Your neurocom system comes with quite a few accessories. But you're not limited to using just these accessories when you're developing your long force plate treatment plan. When you are looking at developing a treatment plan, you can use any type of surface that you want on the force plate. You can use balls. You can use different types of foam. You can use anything that you want, and the choice is going to be determined by what you're trying to do during that treatment session. So now I'd like to start with our first case. This is um, a patient that I worked with a few years ago. He's a 32-year-old male, and he sustained a traumatic brain injury when a metal hatch fell onto his head. And this event had occurred six months prior to his evaluation with me. He had been working full-time for a marine cleaning company, and he had been working for 16 years. When he came to our um, rehab department, he was complaining of headaches, positional dizziness, problems with his vision, irritability, neck pain and stiffness, and memory problems. So along with my neurocom assessments, I always do a standard clinical exam, and this is not an inclusive um, I'm not going to give you the whole exam, but I'm just going to give you the highlights here. So we did a dynamic gait index on him, which was 21 out of 24, which is technically a normal result, but he did demonstrate mild path deviation with head movements, and appropriately, he was using the rail on the stairs. His single limb stance on the right was 17 seconds and the left was 30. He had impaired visual pursuits and saccades, light sensitivity, and impaired convergence. And these were all tested um, just basically we were doing an observational exam in room light. We did a dynamic visual acuity clinical screening, meaning we used the Snellen chart. And he only lost two lines on the Snellen chart from static to dynamic, which is a normal result. His hall type was positive for right posterior canal BBPV. He had limitations in his cervical range of motion. He was um, mildly limited in all planes. His neck was cleared. He did not have any, um, any red flags in his cervical exam, and he just had chronic stiffness from six months of pain. And his goal is to return to work. So I knew that I needed to add my neurocom assessments to this clinical exam because he's got chronic complaints. It's really difficult to quantify his dizziness. I knew I needed to look at his vision more closely, and we did that by having occupational therapy and neurooptometry be involved. And the, the clinical tests I did, the dynamic gait index and the clinical DBA, didn't really give me a lot to go on for developing a treatment plan. So this is his sensory organization test. So what you can see is he's not too, too bad off. His most significant 
finding was on condition five, which is eyes closed on a Sway reference platform. And I'd like to at this point tell you a little bit more about his job. This gentleman um, worked for a marine cleaning company, meaning he cleaned the hulls of tanker ships while they were on the water. So that meant that he wore a respirator and he carried an 80 foot long pressurized hose down a ladder that could be up to 100 feet high. And he wore a headlamp on his head because inside the hull of the ship, there's no light. So imagine yourself coming down a ladder, carrying a pressurized hose, wearing a respirator. He told me he actually would carry two hoses at the same time. And wearing a headlamp, and when he got down to the bottom of the ladder, the hull of the ship was curved and probably sludgy because his job was to clean it. And he had to then get his hose ready and use pressure wash the inside of this curved slippery tanker while it was on the water. So a mild, even a mild balance impairment for somebody like this becomes an a real barrier to returning to work. I also wanted to test him on the InVision software, his dynamic uh, visual acuity test and his gaze stability test. His dynamic visual acuity test was normal. I deferred his gaze stability test because I knew that I needed to test him at quite rapid speeds, and I deferred that because he was still having neck pain and stiffness. I also deferred the head shake sensory organization test until his um, standard sensory organization test score was normal. So just going by what I've shared with you so far, I knew that I needed to treat the sensory impairments that I found on the SOT. Um, the other clinical tests that I did didn't give me very specific um, targets for treatment, but the SOT, I knew that I needed to work, especially on condition five, low light situations with, um, on a surface that is moving or unpredictable. The good news about the DVA is that I knew that I didn't have to send him for more advanced testing and I would proceed to the GST when his next symptoms were better managed. And the six months out of work is always a uh, uh, difficult thing to manage. Um, I knew that he had very specific targets that he had to reach before going back to work and that balance and safety are critical components to his job. So I knew that I wanted to do high level balance training specifically targeted toward condition five especially. Um, I needed to do strengthening, conditioning, and endurance building. His job is very physical. I knew I needed to incorporate cervical retraining, including manual techniques for the stiffness and proprioceptive retraining, so that when we do get his range of motion back, um, he doesn't have a cervical type dizziness problem on top of what he already has. And I knew I was going to get occupational therapy and neural optometry involved um, for his vision. So when I started him, I started him, I knew I wanted him to move, and I knew I had to get him moving on different types of surfaces. So one of the places that I focused on was mobility training level six. When you go into mobility training, what you'll see when you pull up the different levels is you see the different pictures of the model doing the activity. If you mouse over the picture of the model, the target configuration for that particular activity will show up on your screen. So as you're mousing over the pictures, you can actually see what the target is going to look like when you get in and start the activity. I chose this target because it was a pretty basic design. I knew that he was going to be taking three steps, and I could modify it and vary it based on what I wanted him to do. So when I first start the activity, when you're in mobility or when you're in any of the long force plate um, training activities, first you'll get some setup instructions. And the setup for this was place a four inch or eight inch curb in a large center square. Because if you remember, the activity that I chose was actually a stepping up activity. But I'm going to modify it based on the needs of my patient. 
So what I decided to do was to not put anything on the fourth plate initially. I'm going to decrease the challenge initially. I'm not going to have a box or anything there. I'm also going to put the activity on on-demand pacing, which means the patient can self-select how quickly they want to go through the activity. Also, I can challenge him through on-demand pacing to increase or decrease his speed depending on the quality of his, the way he's doing the activity. Once he understands the activity, I can start to increase the challenge. One of the first challenges I can add without changing the setup of the activity is I can add head movement. This will support our findings in the dynamic gait index and his cervical complaint. So immediately I can incorporate another challenge element. I can incorporate head movement to a very basic task to help me with that type of activity that I know he has difficulty with. And I can actually work on his cervical range of motion while I'm doing a balance and mobility test as well. Now, like I told you initially, this patient's job is very challenging. He needs to be able to negotiate in the start significant sensory, significant sensory challenges. So when I progress this exercise for him, and I like to do this for a lot of my patients that have traumatic brain injury, is I add different types of surfaces that the patient has to negotiate. This adds the, this adds uh, the challenge for the patient to be able to make adjustments as they're in an environment that's challenging in real time, they have to adjust to different surfaces. And this is going to be critical for him in his job if he hits, for example, an uneven or a place on the floor of the ship where there's a whole lot of sludge and he's not expecting it. He's going to have to make those adjustments. So this is the same activity, but just modified. And again, if I want to make it even more challenging, I can have him do this activity with head turns. I can have him practice a VOR activity while he's doing this. I can even have him add weight to this activity. If he needs to carry a heavy pressurized hose and manage that hose during his rehab, I can add that. I can simulate um, pressure in the hose by having him hold on to something and have somebody unexpectedly move that if it's a rope or a simulated hose. So for this type of patient, um, you can be very, very creative in your use of the activities on the long force pipe. This particular patient um, had a very successful rehab. We cleared his BBPV, his SOT um, ended up being normal, his cervical complaints resolved. When we moved him to the head shake SOT, he was eventually normal in all directions. Um, and when we were able to test his gaze stability, it was normal and symmetrical. Um, Although we had great success with him in his rehab, unfortunately, he was not able to return to work. And that is because when he had his head injury, he lost his sense of smell, which made it um, impossible for him to safely be tested for his respirator. So um, unfortunately, he was not able to go back to work from that perspective, but he would have been able to go back to work from a physical mobility balance and uh, safety perspective. I'd like to move on now to another case. This is uh, another patient that I saw. This patient is a 58-year-old, and she had a stroke. And her complaints are severe memory deficit. She has gait and balance impairment, left lower extremity weakness, altered voice quality, dysarthria, and a communication deficit. So the highlights of her rehab exam, she had to wear a solid ankle AFO because she had poor knee control on the left. And um, she also had significant weakness and tone in her left ankle. She had sensory changes on the left. Her Berg balance test is a 35 out of 56, indicating that she is at risk for falls. She is able to ambulate short community distances with a cane. Her dynamic visual 
acuity screen was within normal limits. And she was, before she had her stroke, she was working part-time at Trader Joe's, uh, which is a grocery store, and she volunteers at a community art gallery. And so her goals were to get back to these types of activities. So when we think about patients with a stroke, it's pretty easy to see the, their, their motor output. It's easy to see tone. It's easy to see weakness. It's easy to see um, those types of, of asymmetries. But we need to also consider the sensory side of things. She has sensory changes in the lower extremity, and those can sometimes be missed. We also need to see, from a vestibular standpoint, how she is functioning because um, patients that have strokes can also have vestibular involvement. And our clinical tools, they may not be as sensitive to detecting those subtle impairments and documenting changes as the patient improves. So I knew I needed to take a look at her from um, using my NeuroCom data. So this is her sensory organization test. So we have a very clear 5-6 pattern. We have a clear shift in her center of gravity alignment. She's, she's shifting off of her um, left lower extremity, which is her weaker extremity, and shifting over to the right side. You'll notice in the comments that I tested her with her shoes and her AFO on. As she progressed in her rehab, I tested her both with her shoes on and her shoes off as we were making adjustments to her AFO. But I knew that I needed to put that comment in there so that if I was testing her again, I knew which test results to compare to when we were looking at progress. So we know from this data, a 5-6 pattern, she's having trouble in complex situations that require the use of vestibular cues. She's having trouble with her eyes closed on unstable surfaces, and she's having trouble in dynamic environments. Her eyes are open, but she has trouble with the dynamic environment of the walls and the floor being sway referenced. Now, because she also has weakness, we can't say that this is just purely, oh, she must have a vestibular problem, because if she is swaying on the force plate and her legs are weak or her one leg is weak, that could also um, cause her to have difficulty on conditions five and six. So this is her raw data. And you can see that a couple of her falls were immediate, especially on condition six. On condition five, she was able to maintain her balance on the last trial through the duration of the 22nd trial. This is her adaptation test. And the reason that I wanted to look at adaptation was because she in her early stages of rehab, is not able to drive. And so to get to her volunteer, um, to get to her volunteer position, she was going to have to take the bus and walk a short distance from the bus to the art gallery. Um, she wasn't currently working. She was spending most of her time doing her rehab. But I wanted to see if she was able to, if she would be able to uh, be safe in a bus type of environment where she had to get onto the bus and then the bus would suddenly start to move. So I was actually quite pleased with this result on her adaptation test. And again, I tested this with her AFO and her shoes on for this situation. I also ran her through a dynamic visual acuity test. Dynamic visual acuity looks at visual clarity with your head still and then how that visual clarity might change with your head movement. And so she did have a positive finding on her dynamic visual acuity test. She had a 0.3 logmar loss with head movement to the right. So um, to me, that's, that is significant for her. She needs to be able to maintain visual clarity with head movement. So that is something that we also are going to need to address when we do her rehab. Um, 
We know from the literature that sit to stand, when, patient, when a patient has had a stroke, we can use our sit to stand data to help identify if the patient is at risk for falling. And we also can look at that, look at their symmetry with sit to stand. So from the literature, patients after stroke who fall will take longer to stand and they will demonstrate greater sway and asymmetry than patients post-stroke who do not experience fall. So this patient has a 15% asymmetry. If you look down here at this graph, it's saying she puts 15% more weight on her right leg than her left, which is consistent with what we saw on her um, Sensory Organization Test Center of Gravity Alignment. We also see that it takes her a very long time, her weight transfer time is very long to stand, which could be another indicator of risk for falling for this patient. Her walk across test also demonstrates an asymmetry. Um, for this patient, she takes, this is a trace of her walk across. She contacts the force plate with her left foot and immediately brings her right foot up because she doesn't like to weight bear on that left leg. She takes a nice long step with her left foot and a very short step with her right because, again, she's not symmetrically weight bearing. And this, um, this is very uh, clear when you look at her step length symmetry. Her step length on the left is significantly longer because she can weight bear on her right lower extremity. So we decided to test her without an assistive device. Even though she uses a cane, I was hopeful that we were going to get her off the cane eventually. So we tested her without the cane so that we could, could um, again, compare apples to apples when we retested her. We did continue to test her with her AFO on. So when we were developing her treatment plan on the long force plate, we knew that we had to look at weight shifting, um, symmetrical weight bearing so that she could have a more symmetrical gait. We want to speed up that sit to stand and the symmetry of the sit to stand so that she is um, safer from a fall risk perspective. And we know that we have an asymmetry in her dynamic visual acuity. Um, when she turns her head to the right, she's not seeing as well as when she turns her head to the left. So these are all challenge elements that we want to try to incorporate into our long force plate we have for this patient. So for her, one of the activities that we did was sit to stand and this is found in mobility level two. And a couple of things I want to talk to you about. This is a this is one of the areas where the target configurations um, can be a bit confusing. And like I said, they don't have specific instructions of how you're supposed to do the activity. So what I want to encourage you to do with um, any kind of seated exercise is don't hesitate to play with it. Don't hesitate to put yourself or your colleagues on some of these activities and see what the cursor does when you go through the activity because that will help you be able to prepare for what you're gonna, how you're going to instruct your patient. So what you see when you go into mobility training level two, these are the available exercises in level two, and here's what, they, what the model looks like. So the first one is a pre-stand. So this is just a scoot forward and a scoot back. You're not even standing standing up. And this is also a pre-stand activity where you are actually scooting forward. Now this one is the one that's indicated by this target configuration here. This is a stand up and down transition. So this activity, because there are only two target boxes here, this activity is just, um, you are in a pre-stand position, you're already just ready to stand up, and then you do stand up, and then you sit back down. Whereas this very last one in mobility is called a stand up and down task, which actually incorporates all three of these activities into one. 
So you're going to start in a comfortable seated position. You're going to scoop forward. You're going to lean forward. You're going to stand all the way up. And then when you sit down, you're going to scoot all the way back into the chair. So those instructions are not written for you. Um, so that's why I would encourage you to play with the different target configurations. The other thing I do want to mention about any kind of seating activity, when you're setting the patient up for seated training activity, occasionally you have to adjust the seat, the support surface. You have to move the box or the ball so that when the patient is sitting in the center in a good lumbar neutral spine, the cursor is in the center of the screen. And so it might take a little bit of playing from you as a therapist to be able to get that set up okay for the patient. Another really good place to work weight shifting and symmetry is in the weight shifting tab. The weight shifting tab you can find in all of the modules of the um, sequence training. And it's a very simple visual interface and it's like scale. You can actually see, the patient can actually see how much weight do they have on one leg compared to the other leg. And you see this is a, this is a demonstration of somebody who, you can't see this very well, but both of these bars are essentially equal and the patient is practicing symmetrical weight bearing throughout the sit to stand transition. And I have found that people with um, cognitive impairment, they do very, very well with this type of activity because it's very basic and it's, it's very concrete for the patient. So this is another really good way to work symmetry in any kind of standing or sit to stand type activity. When I think about this patient's um, impairments that we found on the exam, one of the problems that she demonstrated was an asymmetry in her step length. She wasn't weight-bearing for a long period of time on the left leg, so she was taking a very short step with the right foot. So for her, one of the activities that I was um, using is called the four-corner stepping exercise. And for any of you that have attended CIS, the Clinical Integration Seminar at Neurocom, you'll know that the four corner stepping is my absolute favorite activity on the long force site. And um, I love four corner stepping because it incorporates a lot of different challenge elements. It incorporates different lengths of the step. It incorporates different speed demands. And it also incorporates direction change, which can be very difficult for the patient. So for those of you that aren't familiar with four corner stepping, there are uh, the target looks like basically four targets, four small targets that are in the shape of a box. And you take a step forward with your left foot to move your cursor into the front left box. And then you bring your right foot up next to the left to bring the cursor into the front right box. And then you take a step back with your left foot to bring your cursor back into the back left hand box and then bring your right foot back next to your left foot. And the beautiful thing about the long force plate and four corner stepping is that you can adjust the length of the step. So you can start the step a very small step within the confines of the large center square on the force plate, or you can adjust to make it a very large step if you are trying to encourage uh, the patient to take a larger step. The other thing about four corner stepping is that you can incorporate um, different types of surface challenge. So for the patient that I was just telling you about, we know that she had difficulty on um, conditions five and six. So if we add some different challenge elements to the surface, we can challenge her that way. We can also add challenges to the visual environment. So for example, we know that this patient has trouble with dynamic visual acuity, especially to the right. We can incorporate her VOR exercises as she's doing this activity. We can um, incorporate other types of head movement. Um, for this type of activity, I wouldn't 
I wouldn't close the patient's eyes because I think that is um, would be a little too difficult, especially for this person. But I might ch I might challenge the patient by saying I don't want you to look down at the surface that you're stepping on. And of course, just for full disclosure, this is obviously not a patient. Um, but I would, for all of my patients on the long force plate, I would always have a gate belt on the patient, and I would be standing very close to the patient to guard them. But I wanted to show the activity um, to you without having um, the operator in the frame. So for this patient, um, she had a lengthy, she had actually um, one um, full term of 12-week rehab, and then she came back the following year for another 12-week rehab stay. Um, at the end of her rehab, she was able to take the bus and go back to volunteering. She was independent with her gait in the community without an assistive device. And now, three years later, she has returned to gainful employment, and she has resumed her driving. So. Um, we felt like that was a very, very positive outcome. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about athletes and how we can use our Neurocom data and uh, the long force plate to help rehabilitate our athletes. So this is a patient who's a 24-year-old basketball player, chronic ankle sprain. So this is not a this is not a person with a current acute ankle sprain, but this is a person who was brought in by the coach and they're looking for some help because they want to uh, make sure this athlete is as safe as possible. So we know that repeated injuries can keep athletes from play. We use a lot of compensatory strategies, taping, um, which may not address the underlying problem. So if we can identify some impairments on these athletes, we can more uh, appropriately target our rehab intervention. And the long force plate gives us a lot of, uh, quite a few avenues to do this. So for this test, I want to remind you of the, uh, the limits of stability test. Now the limits of stability test is challenging even for athletes because we are asking the patient to move their center of gravity to 100% of their limit of stability, which means if they are physically in the target, they are at 100% of their theoretical limit of stability, meaning they should not be able to go any further or they will be falling because they will have exceeded their, their limit of stability. So the limit of stability test tests how quickly somebody can move how accurately they can move, and can they move through their full theoretical cone of stability, which is 12 and a half degrees in the anterior posterior and 16 degrees in the medial lateral. We know that athletes are required to change direction quickly. <clears throat> they need to have very fast reaction responses. We know that the limits of stability test correlates with lower extremity strength and proprioception. So if we look at the limits of stability test as a performance test, meaning we're asking the patient to move as quickly and as accurately as they can to each target, um, we know that those measures correlate with lower extremity strength and proprioception. So if they're doing well on the limits of stability test, then we are more confident that they have intact strength and proprioception in the lower extremity. So this is the limits of stability test for an athlete with chronic ankle sprain. So what I want to point your attention to, first of all, is the trajectory of their trace. So they're not getting all the way out to the target. And once they get out there, they're not doing it with very good control. We're seeing slower reaction times. Now, these reaction times are normal, 
but they're slow. We're, we're seeing slow movement velocity. Um, directional control isn't too bad, and we have some abnormal scores here in the endpoint and maximum excursion going into the anterior target. So for an athlete, this is not what we would expect their performance to be. So for, for athletes and for people with orthopedic complaints, I want to just give you a little um, refresher on closed chain training. Closed chain training is found in the sequence training module. And closed chain actually gives you the opportunity to choose a specific body part. So I can choose, in this case, we chose the body part to be an ankle. And we would also um, choose the side, right or left, whichever side was more effective. But closed chain is a wealth of activities. You can look at specific activities for the knee, the hip, and the back. And the back activities actually have lumbar stabilization activities, lifting activities, um, core stability. So I want to encourage you, again, if you have time, to get in and play with closed chain training, especially if you're working with orthopedic patients. Closed chain was actually originally developed as a model for the orthopedic patient. The beauty of closed chain is that you can limit weight bearing, you can limit how much the patient is weight bearing on the right or the left leg, and if they have an acute injury or um, they are recovering from a surgery, you can actually limit them to 25, 50, or 75% weight bearing. So again, if you mouse over the pictures, you can see the target configuration. So for this configuration, we are limiting the weight bearing on the right leg to 25%. So when the cursor is in this target right here, the patient would have just about 100% of their weight on their left foot. And when they shift over to the right just a little bit, they would only be weight bearing about 25% on the right leg. So this is a really nice way to limit weight bearing when you are in a healing phase or an acute phase. I also have the opportunity to put in some accessories. So this is a wedge, an outside wedge. So for somebody with an acute ankle, I can put them on an outside wedge and protect the lateral structures of the ankle while they're doing a weight shifting activity. And what you do have to remember is if the patient shifts their weight all the way over here, they're putting 100% weight on their right leg. So the system doesn't actually limit how much weight the patient is putting on. That's the clinician's job to make sure that the patient understands the activity and that they are weight bearing through the extremity that you want them to weight bear through. Once we get up to the higher levels in closed chain, this is right ankle closed chain level five, where the patient will be doing 100% weight bearing on that affected ankle, which as we chose in the beginning was the right ankle. So this is an activity where the patient is standing on a rocker board, and you'll see that they have to shift their weight to the left and to the right. So we're facilitating control at the end ranges of um, the ankle when we're having them balance on the rocker board and shift their weight to the left and to the right. So here's a tracing of the left, right. Now you can see the patient standing centered on the rocker board. There isn't a lot of right, left excursion that the patient can actually achieve. It's a very small movement. But the patient is developing strength and endurance. And if you're having problems with chronic ankle sprains, endurance can be a critical factor. So this is a really nice way to work your patient's endurance in the end ranges. We also can look at stability with head movement. So in mobility training level four, we chose a tandem activity where the patient is walking in tandem across the force plate. And when we add, well, first we wouldn't add head movement to this um, activity initially. We would start with having the patient looking straight ahead and keeping their balance. 
But when we add head movement, we now make it a more functional type of a task. For this patient who's a basketball player, I might also add ball handling drills while they're doing this activity. I might be passing them a basketball. I might have them be dribbling a basketball while they're doing this activity to make it more relevant to the patient and to their sport. Some people um, look at the limits of stability test as a test for um, patients when you're looking at fall risk. What I'd like to encourage you to do is look at it for your athletes because we're looking at reaction times, we're looking at speed of movement and directional control. So what I want you to look at here is the improvement in reaction time. The patient got much faster and these endpoint and maximum excursions are all 100% and equal. So that means right off the block, the athlete was able to move quickly and accurately to the target and then maintain stability in that target. Your athletes should not be able, should not be having to make corrections. Once they move, um, they should be going in their intended direction and they should be stable once they're out there. And your long force plate can help you as you determine what are the best treatment options for those patients. So in summary, um, I hope that I reminded you that assessment data is really important to determine first where your sensory and motor impairments are and how you can target them for improvement when you develop the treatment plan. The embedded target configurations and instructions are starting points for you. Um, I hope that I demonstrated the importance of modifying the activity based on the needs for your patient. You don't have to be constrained to what the computer is telling you to do. Think about the, the treatment objectives that you have for that specific patient. Um, also, be creative. When you're developing your treatment plans, think about your clinical tests that you did. Think about incorporating um, other activities like head movement, um, sport-specific activities, and don't be afraid to play with the different targets. If you are not sure what the target is asking of you or for your patient, don't be afraid to play. Get on there and or put your coworkers on there and see what types of activities are, um, uh, what the activity is asking, and then think about how you can modify it to benefit your particular patient population. Kevi, thank you so much for that very thorough and informative presentation. That was excellent. For those of you who need to jump off the line, this will conclude the recording of today's presentation.